I'm here today with David Storer from King, Kingdom City in Perth, Western Australia. David, thanks so much for making time uh, to come and, and uh, have a chat with us today. David, just to, to begin with, no could, you, <laughs> could you uh, just give a, a bit of an outline as to your church planting experience? Yeah, well, the Bible college I went to was uh, very much focused on the fact that we would graduate and plant a church. It wasn't the expectation that we were going to go on team anywhere from the get-go. We were all uh, settled in the mentality and the teaching that, no, nope, this is what you're going to do. You're going to graduate and all of you are going to go off and plant a church. Uh, and so off we went. I served for one year alongside an existing leader in a small country town in uh, Queensland. And then after that one year, we went off to um, a, a place called Charters Towers uh, that's inland from Townsville, uh, Queensland. And uh, we planted a church there. Um, and But uh, look, there was a... a it was more like charge the machine guns, count the, the dead and the wounded later back in those days. And if you survived, you're a hero, but it really was um, just go at it with not a lot of uh, system or support. Um, and I'm a survivor of that era. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, we planted that church and it still exists and thriving today. So that, that's great. And then, but then uh, you, went, you moved after a while to Western Australia. And that's when, from what I understand, that's when the church planting uh, really hit the, the, you really hit your straps with church planting in Western Australia. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because we plant, we, well, I didn't plant the church here. It was a, it was a smallish church, which grew rapidly. And, and uh, because I had planted by this stage two churches myself, um, I got to thinking, well, how would I like to be treated if I was a church planter? So thankfully, God was very gracious. The church grew very quickly. It became very strong. And so from this church, uh, I started to plant out my staff and send with them 100 people, sometimes 200 people uh, to go uh, as a call group to, to get them started. So um, by the time I handed that over, we'd got up to nine churches uh, spaced over mm, about 20 years. So not too bad. I would have liked to have seen more, but um, uh, pl we planted out from this church um nine other churches over the space of 20 years no oh, that, that's incredible and and as i understand some of those churches uh absolutely thrived and i think have become church planting churches in their own right if that's correct yes although they have uh some of them have adopted more a campus model and so uh, yeah, my first uh, one that we planted out is a church of probably over 4,000 people now with mm, five different campuses uh, as well uh, in different parts of Perth and uh, WA. So, yeah, that was the first one. And so, look, they've all done extremely well. They've all had their own unique expression. They weren't all cloned. They're not all cookie-cutter churches. If you go to them... Um, each one is uniquely different in their expression. Uh, and a lot of that comes down to the vision, being in the visionary um, of the senior, you know, being the senior pastor, yeah. Yeah, so how, what would you say is the key to raising up the leaders of these church plans? Um, I just believed in them. I didn't have, um, I think it comes back to my kingdom attitude, understanding kingdom, that it's all, uh, all it's not mine. Uh, these people, uh, most of them were staff that I planted out, so I'd had a time to observe them, uh, leadership emerging uh, in their lives. I could see that if I kept them, they, it would be just a glass ceiling. Um, and that really their destiny laid beyond my church and my leadership. 
And they were just entrusted to me by Jesus to nurture them, input into them. But when the right time came, it was time to plant them out. So there was just a recognition from the get-go that um, I was just part of their journey. And it was a win-win. They, they were great leaders, so they inputted well to the team. But the time came when the, the next step was, for them was beyond um, the team that I was directly responsible for. And so we sat down, we talked and uh, worked out a time structure, um, a strategy and planted them out using, uh, you know, the, the certain method that we developed over a period of time. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, I've heard it said that you're uh, one of the keys in doing this is that you're a spiritual father and you have uh, spiritual sons who have actually gone out and done the planting. Um, would you like to, would you mind describing what, what in your mind it is to be a spiritual father? Yeah, well, that's uh, a term that I had to get used to. I didn't, uh, uh, you know, um, ask for that. It was more by people observing. Yeah. Um, so um, I wasn't quick to go, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> I just uh, found it, it, it happening. Um, and I just, by the grace of God, seem to have had these very unique gifted leaders that I recognize leadership on them. And I'm still in relationship with them today. I can pick up the phone, call any of them. Uh, you know, when we could travel, I'd, um, I'd get invited regularly to their churches to speak, etc., and so on. So, um, yeah, I think a father is, in, you know, brothers might be jealous of one another and a bit of, you know, rough and tumble, but not fathers. Fathers have a different attitude towards their sons. They're, they're more, come on, you can do it. And they celebrate their success, where my, I think brothers struggle with one another, and I must say I have observed that a little bit <laughs> amongst uh, my spiritual sons from time to time. Um, it's quite obvious they're not fathers, they're, they're um, other than towards one another, <laughs> they're more brothers. Um, but I just celebrate them all and uh, have really had the joy of, of seeing them thrive, really. Uh, understanding that, like a father, they grew up in my house, but um, it's time for them to go off and have their own family. And, you you know, you celebrate that as a father. Yeah. yeah no, that's great. Now, David, I understand there was a, a pivotal time in, in your life when you went to a place in Victoria called Hall's Gap and you went into a little shop there and uh, something really hit you. Would you mind uh, telling us about that story? Yeah, that was um, back in the days of milk bars. Some of the older people listening would remember what a milk bar is. Uh, yeah. Look, um, I was pastoring a church in country Victoria, but I was not, uh, the church was doing well, but I wasn't. I was uh, having palpitation of the heart. I, I was obviously not handling a stress very well. I sort of hit the wall. I was uh, very uh, exhausted. And so I took my family on this holiday and um, I got up early uh, in the morning, walked down to the milk bar to get, you know, the milk and the bread and whatnot. And I'm standing there. And of all things, this shopkeeper had put, he must have been a Christian, he had up on the wall uh, uh, from the message, um, you know, um, are you uh, tired and weary? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me and I'll show you how to take a real rest. So I'm in the queue and I'm looking over at this poster on the wall and thinking, what's going on? You know, the, uh, it was like a God moment. And of course, I had this moment of realization Either Jesus is lying or I've turned left when I should have turned right. I, I, I'm here tired. I'm here exhausted. <laughs> I'm here not doing well. And yet I'm reading this promise uh, of, from Jesus saying, no, no, if you come to me, I'm going to give you rest. Um, I'll show you, you know, how to take a real rest and et cetera. You know, learn the rhythms of grace as the scripture goes. Beautiful. The unforced way that rhythms you of grace. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Eugene Peterson does a great job. Yeah. But it just uh, 
flipped me. I just realized something's wrong. I'm doing ministry wrong. I, I you know, Jesus isn't lying. Something is has happened here. And I just left with my milk and bread walking back home, realizing I needed to really examine the way I was doing ministry. And from that came my understanding of I'd been running a factory, uh, churning out Christian widgets. <laughs> um, you know, it was all about counting. It was that intense thing of, you know, people would say, how are you, David? And I'd tell them how many people were there on Sunday. You know, there's something right. They asked me how I was, but I was so strongly identified with my performance and evaluating my identity through how well my church was going. And it, um, look, I was just lifting the load all wrong and realized that it's not a factory, it's an orchard. And that this is the vine and the branch. This is a very an organic thing that I'm sure I've got all these wonderful uh, trees around me, but I'm creating an environment for them to thrive. That's my job that already as a tree has innately got within it this life uh, and this desire to bring forth fruitfulness. My job is to create an environment for that to happen. And along with that just came the faith, the belief for that. Now, at the same time, um, that just married into an explosion of my understanding of how kingdom works. You know, Jesus said, you know, the kingdom is like a man that sows seed. He goes and sleeps and he gets up and first comes the stalk and then the ear, then the grain, you know, and he knows not how it says. He doesn't really know how this is happening. Um, so all those parables started to come together, my understanding of kingdom, or how there's a, there's a life here. There's, it's the spirit of Jesus bringing something forth and... Um, 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 and then from that came my understanding of kingdom mathematics, what I ended up calling kingdom mathematics, that it's like, um, you know, you can prune a rose bush, but you're actually doing it a favor uh, because from that comes this whole uh, renewal and this constant new growth that's coming. And so people thought I'd gone mad when I started to put into place this whole planting method of releasing and now we didn't release the people we wish would go we we <laughs> released core people that would tithe that was the condition that we released them on if you're going to be part of the core team you have to tithe so my elders at first thought i'd gone mad um became concerned that here i was releasing these people uh, but it was kingdom mathematics you know it seemed like the rose bush the more we pruned it the more we grew ourselves um, so at the time of me handing over this church that had already birthed nine other churches, uh, we were about 4,000 people strong, uh, ourselves. Um, and yeah, there's more I could say about how we had to learn stuff along the way of that, but yeah, that was quite a journey and it all started in a milk bar. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to have a movement to bring back milk bars so we can all go on that journey, I think. Yeah, that's it. And so one last question for you, David. Uh, the, the pastors of churches that are out there at the moment, you've just got given incredible but also courageous advice about be prepared to give away your best. That's basically what you're saying. Uh, if you want, If they want to see Kingdom Mathematics, is there any other key or are there any other key points that you would uh, say to them in terms of uh, how they can how they can discover and raise up planters and, and plant churches out of their current church? Yeah, look, I, I can only speak for my own journey, um, but um, we got to make them champions once again. Uh, to me, church planters are absolute champions. They're on the coal face. Um, and so my understanding of explorers, pioneers and developers. And um, we live, sadly, uh, with our conferences, our seminars have, have polarised towards speaking to developers, uh, people uh, building their churches. And, and we have diminished... 
um, our celebration of the explorers and the pioneers. We wouldn't have developers if we didn't have explorers and pioneers. So um, I would just say, come on, let's celebrate these men and women who are prepared to go off, um, leave the comfort of a secure wage and, um, you know, all the comforts of being maybe a part of a larger church with um, all that goes with that, the security that goes with that. There, we got to really realize these, these are absolute champions and uh, we got to celebrate them as we would champions, support them as we would champions. Realize that, hey, um, we all had to, we're all reaping the benefit of the, the uh, explorers and the pioneers. Um, all of those nine churches started out, you know, they, they might be established now and doing well and have their own teams, but they started because yeah. at first there was an explorer, then a pioneer. And now we have this development stage, but it seems like we've polarized towards just church development um, and diminished the importance of the explorer and the pioneer. Yeah, no, that's great wisdom. Very, 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 very important wisdom. David, I really appreciate your insights. Um, I know we had you speaking at a conference of ours a couple of years ago, and uh, um, your insights are often um, uh, out of normal paradigms. I'll put it that way. That they're away from normal uh, from people's normal paradigms. But I'll tell you what, they're greatly, greatly appreciated. And so, thank you again for just taking the time uh, to connect again uh, today and to provide some wisdom here. Uh, which I think is it's really, really worthwhile. Um, pastors of churches who want to plant, actually just taking the time to actually review the principles that you've talked about today. So thanks and blessings. My pleasure.